Welcome to the Wednesday live stream for Dulcimer Crossing. Today, our theme is, oh, I forgot to write it into my, I forgot to edit it in here. Hold on a second, just a minute. There it is. Motivation to practice. This is a question that comes up often with my private students. And uh, even with professionals, we'll talk about, you know, what is, I, I, I just can't seem to get started. I can't get practice in this week. And there was a particular student last week that had me thinking, of, that just led me to be thinking about this topic. So that's why I chose it for today. Motivations for practice. What are our motivations for practice? What are the things that can help us do the thing we know we need to do, but we may not want to? <laughs> right it's it could be a challenge right so how do i get motivated to find motivation doug says exactly that's the problem it's like i need the thing that's going to make me do the thing i need to do in order to do the thing <laughs> so let's talk about what are some common motivations to practice um when i was a kid playing the piano it was my mother's rule. <laughs> my motivation was all stick. <laughs> and uh, and I had to practice 20 minutes, and she had an egg timer. I don't know if she ever used it for eggs, but we had an egg timer is what it was called. And you'd turn it to 20 minutes, and then tick, 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 tick. And if she didn't hear some piano playing, she'd yell from the other room because she'd yell, I don't hear the piano. And I'd say, I'm going, I'm picking, I'm going through the music. And I found ways to take extra time to go through the music, right? So my motivation was primarily at that point in the lessons, the push rather than the pull of the desire. Now, my teacher was always working on the attraction side of it. She would always say, what music do you want to play? And my problem was I didn't know. Um, I knew what I didn't want to play. And after we, after I'd hear it, it's like, yeah, it's not that either. And she would go, I'm sure I was a challenge. I may not have been the only student that was a challenge. She had quite a few students, but, um, I'm sure I was a challenge because she would go to music stores and bring books. Is it going to be boogie woogie? Well, I'd never heard of what a boogie woogie was. She was playing. It, it was kind of cool, but that didn't really sound like what I wanted. I didn't really know about the classical stuff. Um, and it wasn't until I was in seventh grade and I had friends who'd been playing as long as I had who were playing Bach and Beethoven and Chopin and, and Brahms. And, you know, they were playing all these people. And it's like, I never had that option. That doesn't sound familiar to me. Um, I wish I'd had that option. You know, I started, then the hunger got there and I was buying those books with my own money. So some, and, and when I first wanted to play, I was, I was five and we had a piano at home. Mom would play. So there was the model of someone playing and me enjoying music. We'd hear the piano and the organ in church all the time. And in Sunday school, the, somebody would play the piano and we'd sing Jesus loves me and uh, loves the little children and all those songs that are Sunday school related songs. Um, so I wanted to play. I had a hunger to do it. And they made me wait because the model at the time was you can't play piano until you can read music. You can't read music until you can read English. So I was five. It was pre-literate in terms of words and things. So you have to wait till you're in first grade and you start doing Dick and Jane and Spot and the bicycle and the dog and, and uh, hop on pop and things like that. That was the way they were thinking at the time. This was the mid sixties. Um, this is not the way music has always been taught and it's not the way it's being taught now. Um, with my work with preschool musicians who are children six months to five years old, one of the things that's noticed is children respond to music right away. And, and, and I'm doing something they're observing. And if I lean in and, make an invitation with my nonverbal cues, they'll get, they'll join with me. And if I start clapping my hands, they'll imitate. And so the motivation then becomes, I want to be, participate. And a lot of times as adults, if we've had these, all these um, 
kind of layers of expectation for what music should be or what we should be doing, or we're telling stories in our head or we're rehearsing stories that someone else told us in our head. Um, we can miss that inner I want to. And I always tell people that the I want to is the most important part of playing music. I want to do this. I, I've one of my good, good friends and colleagues this past weekend at a, um, at the Kermatic Mountain Dulcimer Summit, the first ever that it happened, said he said it this way. He says, for one reason or another, we're all addicted to music and we can try to stop it, but we just don't seem to be successful at stopping. <laughs> and for all of us, the 50 of us or so that were in that event, that's, I think, true. That there is something about us that just makes us keep coming back to it. So, I've decided, I've, I've shelled out money, I've got an instrument, I've decided I want to play it. What can be my motivation for playing? Um, one is I made a commitment that I'm going to do it every day. So uh, I, in a similar way, um, got it, Jug, uh, Doug, interesting. That's very interesting. It's been in you for so long, you can't even remember not. That's That's cool. I met a painter once who said he decided that what he was going to do was draw every day. So he was from Australia, but he was in Colorado and he spent time drawing in his sketchbook every day. He said, this is just, I made this commitment. And then at least once a week, I'm going to push paint around. He didn't say, I'm going to try to paint a picture. He didn't say, I'm going to do this this uh, scene or anything. I'm just going to push. My commitment is to move my pencil, push paint. He, he, he said, I know that I need to do this activity. And something about it was part of his mental health, but it was also part of his create creative outlet. The more he did it, the more comfortable he felt doing it. So there is something about just setting, building in time in my schedule. It, it's my time for this. Now, a piece of the motivation could be, this means it's not my time to pay bills. It's not my time to talk on the telephone with someone who wants me to do something. It's not my time to take out the trash. This is my time to do this thing. And there'll be boundaries on it. So sometimes the motivation can be, this is my self-care. Or I said I was going to do it, and I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it every day for this amount of time with the end goal, there's another motivation. I have a goal. I want to do something. Now, what is the something? I had a, uh, I had a guitar student who was in uh, middle school. So she would have been seventh grade, I think. And my daughter knew her from choir, but she came and, and took guitar lessons with me because she had a goal. This was the fall. Her sister was getting married the next June. She wanted to play for the wedding. She didn't play guitar before this. So she had a definite goal with an end point and something she wanted to do. She did it. She worked, we worked on, she worked on her skills. We worked on the music all through the school year and she played for that wedding. Later on, she became a performer when she was in high school and would play the local coffee shops. She would play piano. She would play guitar. And then she decided she wanted to play mountain dulcimer. So she kept adding new instruments. And that's how I got connected with her again. She went to the Berkeley School of Music and now lives in New York. And she's a musician. That's the golden child, I think, is the name of her, her persona. Per, um, performing identity, and group when there's an ensemble, the golden child or gold child or something like that. Um, but it's just, she had this goal to play for her sister's wedding. It was a personal thing. It was a gift for her sister. It was a special one-time event that led to all these other things happening. And so often the Olympics are happening right now. One of the things they're highlighting are the stories of how does one become an Olympian? Often it's when they're, uh, someone is nine or 10, which means they're basically being overlooked by everybody in their world, in the world. Their parents are saying, oh, you can't drive yet. You're not a teenager. They're, you're not the same kind of cute you were when you were a preschooler. And 
this is when all those ideas of who I am and what I want to do are getting solidified or the opportunities are there to try some things that help build on that hunger to be creative, to do something. So she took that and she turned it into, she started when she was 12 or something like that, but turned it into something that became a life goal. So there's a motivation by having a goal at the end, but sometimes the motivation can be, I need a skill that I don't have yet. So a student yesterday was talking about, I can do this, I can do it up to speed, but I'm missing this one little piece when I do it up to speed. I would like to be have, the, have this little fancily diddly do in the piece that when I'm playing at a slower tempo, it's there. But when I'm playing it fast with the people who are speed demons, the diddly do doesn't show up. So that can be a motivation. I want my diddly do, which is good at this tempo, to be good at this tempo. So what am I going to do? I'm probably going to woodshed. I'm going to choose a strategy of just working on that diddly do, working on it. Maybe I only do that with a metronome and I do 20 times. And then I pick up the temp tempo and do it 20 times and pick up the tempo and do it 20 times. Then I play the whole song at the slower speed, then pick it up, pick it up, pick it up until the diddly do becomes something that's less the problem and more the thing I'm looking forward to. And if I can do it for this one song, it'll be applicable to something else. So sometimes it's that inner hunger to do something. Sometimes it's a goal at the end. Sometimes it's a skill in the middle. Um, and Doug, I like this. <laughs> I'm looking for the squirrel, the squirrel moments. Sometimes, and this would happen when I was playing with the egg timer ticking away too. I'd be playing the thing I needed to play and I'd actually accidentally bump into something that was more interesting. And I don't know if you've had this experience. It's why it's what I miss about libraries, physical libraries, where you're in there and you can smell the paper getting old and musty and, and dusty and things like that is as you're looking through the books, you, you find things you weren't looking for, or you didn't know you were looking for. The same thing can happen on Google, but it's a different thing because Google tailors their searches so much to what you've already looked for in the past that it's less likely for you to find those big surprises. But there was a column in the newspaper when I was growing up. When I delivered two different newspapers from two different cities at different times in my small town. We were outside the county seat. We were also outside the biggest city that was nearby. And at different times, I delivered both newspapers. The one newspaper had a section called the peach section because it was not printed on regular newsprint. It was printed on peach colored paper. And there were, this was maybe the lighter side of the news. There were you know, uh, pictures of when it was winter time, there were pictures of people swimming in Australia. There were stories, the, the hints from Heloise was in that section. But also there was a regular column called Things I Found While Looking Up Other Things. And the writer would talk about, I was looking for this and this is what I found on the way to it. And it's like peripheral vision. I'm seeing things out of the corner of my eye while I'm focused over here. And I think that's that's where a lot of creativity can come from because we're so focused on this goal, we're trying to put on blinders like you know they would put on horses so they wouldn't be distracted. And it's what's over here that's really what's gonna catch my attention. Now, obviously sometimes if I have that goal of playing for the wedding in the in June and it's it's September. I have some room for squirrel time. It gets to be May. Maybe I need blinders because I need to focus on my goal. But, you know, there's different different responses to the squirrel moments or the things that are attract your attention at different times, depending on what our overall goal is. But for me, the discovery, you know, the discovery of, oh, it's not so much that it's a discovery of the thing. It's a discovery that it intrigues me. This is the thing that came to my attention. I want to follow that and see what happens. Now, sometimes that can be a chord. It's like, oh, I would not normally think that would be something I'd want to hear. But in when I play it, there's a feeling I have. Now, can I find it again when I want to? What are I? Where do I come from to get to here? And where do I go from after that? 
Sometimes it's a chord that's already in a song and I'm going to take it out and use it and see what happens when I take that one piece out and do it somewhere else. So it becomes an exploration. So sometimes my, motiva my motivation is just exploration in the same way that uh, Jean-Luc Picard and Captain Kirk would do, you know, uh, Captain's Log, Stardate, whatever, and then they'd tell you what had happened, but they're always on the quest to, to learn new things. Sometimes we can we can feel like everything has already been discovered. Everything new has already been found. There's nothing new under the sun, says Ecclesiastes, the, the preacher, the Koholet in Ecclesiastes. Nothing new under the sun. All is vanity. There's new stuff because it can be new to us. And sometimes it's new to us, not because we haven't heard it before, but because now it's on our radar. Now we're paying attention to it. So the motivation can be the internal, I want to, it can be, I have a goal. I want to have a completion date. I want to, I want to develop a skill or I want to hone something that I can't do yet. Or there's a bit of discovery that I've made over here. And the other one we talked about is just, this is my commitment. It's what I'm going to do. And it's for me. Now, if you've made your commitment and there's something important like surgery, dentist appointment, or something like that that gets in the way, obviously we have to set aside the, the thing for me because we're doing something else for us. But I think it's not a bad idea. In fact, uh, Julia Cameron, um, who is, uh, let's see, Walking in This World is the second of her trilogy of books, The Artist's Way, Walking in This World. And I haven't gotten to the third. I have it, but I haven't gotten to it yet because I'm still in walking in this world, she talks about taking an artist date every week. You take your artist to do something that's fun, that's artistic, and it can be anything. And you take a walk every day. That was the other thing is just let your, your brain clear. Now, it could be that you walk on your strings. You walk on the fretboard. You walk on the fingerboard. It You, know, you can decide how that is. But if you don't build those discovery um, times in, it's easy for what we're doing to become rote and repetitious and tiring. Now, the, the final thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention today is often my students will say, I'm tired of what I'm playing. And so I'll use the metaphor of climbing a mountain. You start at the trailhead, you walk and walk and walk, and it looks like, you know, trees, maybe there's some views, some rocks, not a lot different. And at some point, you keep looking up and you say, I'm so far away from the top of the mountain. We forget to turn around and look behind us and see how far we've come. Oh, I have come a good long way. So do I want to quit now or do I want to rest? So we we'll take kind of take a break and a rest. And maybe it's on a mesa. Maybe there's just a nice rock to sit on. We'll just rest now. But then when we start to get bored with what we're doing, it's time to climb again, is what I'll use as the metaphor. So what would climbing look like? It could be that, ah, now it's time for me to make one change in the exercise that I was doing. So using a guitar as an example, so that it's not either one dulcimer or the other dulcimer, I can say, I usually do my scales. <laughs> doing my modal scales. Um, uh, let me get it. Oh, yeah. So. could say, oh, I'm missing this. I'm missing something. And now I've got to practice that so I don't miss it again. What I'm just doing is, okay, it's not as I'm not, I was trying all the modes, wasn't quite ready. It was a warm up. I'm going to call that my warm up and my tune up warm up hard thing. 
So maybe now I want to play the scale. Dun, 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 dun. But I'm tired of that. So I could stair step it. Or I could do triplets. I could go up. And I could also just play melodically. On a fret chromatic instrument like this, I can just keep changing key by half steps, and I don't have to change my patterns at all. I can just say, I want to have these patterns. Um, I like that. And Talon, you're saying discovery enjoyment is one that motivates you good. And I like Jim Fry, the pinball reward. You get the goal, that means you get to play again. Right. You've earned some replays. Yeah. Nice. It's not, for me, this whole pursuit of music and creativity is not about getting to the place where, well, I'm done. I did that. Now I'm done. For me, it's always about it's about the the chance to do it again because it is like Doug you said at the beginning. I don't practice; I play, and I think it's easy for us to forget that we don't work music; we play music, which is something I say in the habits a lot. It's just a reminder that while there may be work involved, the goal is not for us to sweat and have to take a shower when we're done. Although, if we've had a performance that took a lot of energy. Everybody around us is going to want us to take that shower. <laughs> but for me, the goal is being lost in the music, getting into the flow state, being so into, the, I'm, you know, I'm, what song was that? I'm so into you. It was a kind of an R&B song from some point in my, my growing up history. But to be so into the music that I don't even know where I am or when I am or what I'm doing. It's just being in the music and for me the other thing that that the other place that happens is in the recording studio where i've got headphones on it's like i can hear the inside of my instrument it's like i get to be inside the instrument because i may be doing things but it's about being part of the tone i'm helping to create the tone i'm feeling it vibrate but it's it's like we're i'm dancing with the tone and that's one of those oh yeah and everything else I do is leading me toward one of those experiences. And I can live off the, the uh, that fills my tank. I can live off that juice for a while. No, not forever. But I can always, I can always revisit the memory of when I had that. And that has some extra juice with it too. That's, yes, put some skin in the game. And I know Jim and you and I have talked about this. Um, the guitar right here is now 21 years old. But when I was looking for a guitar I could fall in love with instead of the one I had to buy off the wall on time because my guitar that I'd been gifted, no, that I'd bought when I was in high school, saved up my shekels and bought that, it imploded. The neck just went, and I found this out on Tuesday when I had a gig on Saturday. I had to have a guitar. I... um. So I got one off the wall, I played the gig, and I never, I could never get to be in tune. It didn't feel, it was a couple of years of playing that, really wrestling with it before I finally realized I need to have an instrument that inspires me. So I started on a quest and I lived in Northern Colorado. I played everything in Northern Colorado from the Wyoming border on the north. I didn't cross the mountains to the west, but I did go to Greeley on the east and I went south to Arvada and Denver and and Boulder, Loveland, Fort Collins, everything I could find. And it turns out the very first night I started my quest is when I found the one I was looking for, but you can't fall in love on the first date. So I ended up unconsciously comparing and then the price tag was like, oh no, this is not going to work. It's too many shekels. But I'd said at the beginning that I needed to have one that inspired me and that's the one that inspired me. 
um, Jerry Palmer, who was an amazing fingerstyle guitar player from Northern Colorado, was working at the store. And he said, you know, sometimes you have to get the instrument that inspires you. And even though it costs more than you think you're worth, you have to buy it and earn it. And that's what Jim, you're saying there. And we've talked about that um, in your experience too. I don't think I'm worth this instrument. Well, okay, then earn it. <laughs> Put your energy into it. And my experience that I can tell you is when I do that, I earn it. It actually becomes, it becomes enjoyable and I don't feel bad about it. It's like I found what I was looking for. Now, Doug, you're saying it's easy to overbuy books and the motivation to buy the book is this is going to help me play like I want to play. It's easy once the books are there to forget which ones to look at. Or in my moment of I don't have any motivation mm -hmm. is like I, I will almost purposefully not look at the bookshelf. Now, when I was living in Colorado or California, almost all of my music books were in boxes in storage. So it came time and I would think, Oh, I, I know I have this in this book. I don't know which box or which room in storage it's in. It was a real big disincentive to find it. Now I've one of my goals in in Idaho has been to have some shelves where my books can be. And I now I don't know not just which box they were in California. I'm not sure which room they're in or what shelf they're on, but I know they're on a shelf. And so one of the things that could be my motivation is to say, and I did this two weeks ago, I, I was playing through everything in the Fiddler's Fake Book. And I've made notes to myself in there when I've recorded it, what tuning it would work on the dulcimer, uh, what modes happening, um, where I know this from, or do I play this with this person? Uh, I might circle one of the recordings that they mentioned in there because I've, I've got that recording or um, the Portland collection of country dance tunes. I have uh, checked it off to say I, I've played through this one. I'll have an exclamation point as one notification. I'll have a great big, it's like, yeah, there was something special about this one. I'll have a star if I really like it. And then if it's one that I've learned at some point, I'll put the date on it that I've learned it. And as I open up the old book that I forget about, I'll open up and go, Oh yeah, five years ago, I learned this tune. Do I still remember it? Do I still like it the same amount? Hmm, I might've had just had a check mark on it and had the date that I learned it. But now when I play it, it needs an exclamation point or it needs a star. Um, so I leave myself some breadcrumbs that way. Uh, but one of the things you could do is when I don't know what to play, look at your library, as you're saying, Doug, and say, let me look through this book. Now, it may be that that book will be the one that clearly tells you, like I told my piano teacher, this is not the one. But it might be next to the one, here's the theme returning, things I found while looking up other things. I'm looking in this book that I think might be my motivation, and it turns out the one three over is the one that's really what I wanna see now. So the I wanna is the biggest part, Having a goal, and we've made this list before, it's all here. If you want to return to it, this is archived here on, on uh, Facebook and the Dulcimer Crossing Facebook page. It's also archived on our new website, which is in the process of being beta tested. And soon we'll have everyone who is a member of Dulcimer Crossing at this time have an opportunity to look through the whole brand new one before we completely transfer everything over. We're in the process of feverishly transferring content. So it's all in the new site. It's not all there, but we are making progress. And in fact, uh, Linda, my partner in Dulcimer Crossing said, I think I can begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Before it was just, no, it was a cave. There was no tunnel about it. It was just dark, but now we're getting there. Um, if you have questions about that, please feel free to write me here in the comment section, or you can write me at steve at, at dulcimercrossing.com. And uh, I guess that's what I have for us right now. Coming up next month, the Redwood Dulcimer Day is going to be taking place for both mountain and hammer dulcimers in uh, the week of this. It's, it's hosted out of um, Santa Cruz, California, and it's the weekend of the 20th and the 21st. The workshops are on the 21st, and there's a concert. Um, Lois Hornbostel and a Hukai uh, 
Teves, Taves. I don't know if I've ever heard his last name said out loud, or I don't know that I've heard him tell me how he wants it to be said, but they are the, the outside, uh, the performers who are the focus performers. They're going to be doing a concert. Jessica Como, Neil Hellman, Peter Tomerup. Um, there's a good long list. Oh, that's a good topic, Talon. We'll talk about that in another one. Let's talk about that. That's a good topic. So we can do conversion of tablature from one tuning to another. Excellent. Well, I'll say goodbye for today and uh, get to work on that next one. And uh, I wish you well and go forth and play your music.